Hi, this is Roger Magolis, Research Director at O'Reilly Media, and I'm here with Khaled El Amam, who is the a lot of things. He's the uh, Can Canada Research Chair in Electronic Health. He's and he works at Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. And he also is involved with a startup called Privacy Analytics that I know something about. So welcome Great. to the Thank discussion you. today. Thank you, Roger. And what we're going to start with is. You've been in this field a long time. I mean, I, you came to my attention quite a while ago, right. and I really learned a lot by, from your webinars and, and your books and stuff. So you've been involved in this data anonymization around health research space for a long time. But generally, what does, what does that look like in, with health data? You know, if you're to a lay person, how does that look? Well, the, the, um, first, you want to make a distinction between uh, personal information and, and not personal information, non-personal information. So personal information can identify individuals, individual patients. So that means that the data, the information has their name, their social security number, or has other pieces of information that can identify the, the patients, such as their date of birth, their zip code. And non-personal information is information where, that infor where those details don't exist anymore. Either they've been removed or they've been scrambled in some, in some way so that it's very difficult to figure out the identity of the individuals. But a really important thing when we talk about analytics is this non-personal information um, uh, is still analytically useful. So you don't distort it or scramble it so much that you can't do any meaningful analysis on it. You really want to make sure that the data quality at the end is good enough for data analysis and you essentially get the same conclusions from the uh, anonymized data or the non-personal health information as you did with the personal health information. Yeah, I usually hear that referred to, and I've heard you say this as that the data utility stays yeah. high. That's um, right. With yeah. that. And that's really important. Yeah. So clearly what's important here is privacy, right? right. There's health data, it can be very sensitive, can have consequences in, right. in, in your life. Um, what do you see as the privacy concerns with, with health data and anonymizing it? Well, there are, there are a number of different concerns. I mean, there's the regulatory perspective and then there's the uh, more general perspective. So uh, when, when we share health data, uh, peop, um, the, the regulations require us to either uh, obtain consent or of the patients or, or to anonymize uh, the, the data. And essentially, anonymization means you cannot determine the identity of the individual. Um, and that addresses a number of issues, as I mentioned, regulation. It, it, mentioned, uh, it addresses the uh, concern around data breaches. So if the data user loses the data or has the data stolen or you know, it's lost in uh, data on a laptop that's been uh, forgotten in the car and the car was broken into it and so on, you don't have to incur all the costs of breach notification, which can be quite significant. Um, and so, so that the anonymization piece is what the regulations require. There's also the other side of it, which is um, uh, stigmatizing, what I call stigmatizing analytics, which is when the data users start drawing inferences from the data that can have a, a stigmatizing impact on the patients. So um, you know, the, the you can draw inferences from the data uh, about the patient's behaviors, their prognosis, or link their health data with other kinds of data and make predictions about their school performance. Uh, you know, uh, uh, are they likely to commit a crime or not? Um, so these are kind of stigmatizing analytics that can that can uh, result in, in people not being employable or affect employability, insurability, um, their reputation, and so on. So these stigmatizing analytics are not regulated, except in the research context. So usually IRBs look at these things, but outside research, these are not regulated. So you need some kind of governance mechanism to manage the inferences and the consequences of these inferences. So these are the two main privacy concerns with sharing health information. The anonymization piece and protecting identity. Um, you know, it helps with patient trust as well, of course. So we know that uh, patients uh, change their behavior when they have concerns about how their health information is going to be used. They don't seek care. They lie to their doctor. They self-treat. They self-medicate. Um, and of course, none of these things is, is good. It, distorts the data, it's very harmful to the patients, and a very large percentage of people admit to doing this. So the trust component is really important, but you really have to take a, uh, account of the identity piece and the uh, analytics and inference, uh, stigmatizing analytics and inferences piece. Mm -hmm. well, I think this just shows just how complicated health, you know, health data is, and why, why it's different than a lot of other things, is that the consequences are just so much bigger than, they, than for other things. Like, like if you've been doing a lot of Candy Crush Saga, is tells one thing about you, but your health data says a lot more right. uh, exactly. about it. So we brought up 
de-identification and utility before. So let's just get a little more detail about how they pair, you know, right. the mechanisms that make utility remain high. Um, uh, well, so, so anonymization and data utility are essentially, uh, um, on, you, know, you can think of, think of them as tra trade-offs on the same co continuum. I mean, um, the more you anonymize, the less data utility you will, gain, you will have, and the more data utility you will have, it, it means the less privacy, basically, you, you will have in your data. So uh, ideally, you want to um, have a trade-off or balance these two things uh, against each other so that you can provide uh, strong assurances on the privacy issue but still produce data that has the high data utility. So this is where the math comes in. Right, it's where the algorithms come in and the, te you know, the technical methods come in to ensure that the, the, the uh, uh, it's an optimization problem, so all the optimization techniques you're using will still uh, guarantee provide the privacy guarantees but minimize the distortions to the data. And so they're good methods and they're not so good methods. So you always want to make sure that you uh, uh, use the best in class, so to speak, or best uh, methods available to, to maximize this data utility. In terms of protecting privacy, just one thing I wanted to say is uh, it's really, it's possible today to measure quantitatively uh, the risk of uh, re-identifying individuals. Um, there's a large body of work, it's been around for many decades, um, so it's possible to measure the risk. You have to make assumptions, but data analysis means making assumptions, uh, as long as these assumptions are reasonable and defensible. You can measure the risk, and once you can measure the risk, you can start managing it, you can start setting thresholds, you can start having meaningful conversations about whether this is acceptable risk or not. So you balance that against data utility, and you can also measure data utility, so now you have two metrics that you, you essentially balance mm -hmm. against each other. That's great, because what I like hearing about that is um, we think that one of the things that's going to be happening is data will help medicine get more personal, more precise and stuff. So given that it's something that we see happening, what do you see happening in the, in the kind of what's coming up with privacy, de-identification, health data, and so forth? Well, I, I think, I mean, the, the, the uh, demand for data is just incredible, and it's, it's growing so fast. Uh, even from you know, our experiences, what, what we were seeing a year ago, the, the last strata Rx, and now, uh, the, it really there's been just a lot of change, and I, I expect to see that change, just the demand for data to, to continue increasing. And it's not just, uh, the type of data is also changing. So before, it was mostly you know claims data, because that was what was available. Now we're seeing EMR data, with large, quantities of all the clinical data in, in, in uh, you know, your family doctor's practices or your hospital um, being available and then linking it to claims data, linking it to pharmacy data, and linking it to lab data. So now we're starting to look at linked data sets becoming available which essentially cover the full continuum of care. So this becomes very powerful because then you can uh, start uh, understanding the impact of certain drugs, certain treatments, what happens to the patient after they leave the hospital, when they take this drug, do they show up and emerge uh, a day or two later? So, so you can then start looking at adverse events of drugs. So, so, and then, of course, the, the linking doesn't stop there because we're also starting to see uh, uh, linking of health data with other types of non-health data, education data, to look at the relationship between infant health and performance at school, justice data, so you start looking at the relationship between inmates' health, uh, before and after, um, they, they complete their sentences, um, and uh, immigration data as well, so you start looking at the health of immigrants when they come into a, con a country, and how that evolves and changes over time. So when you start having these, these linked data sets, the, the uh, uh, analysis you can do just opens up uh, significantly. Yeah, one of the things you didn't bring up, I'm sure you're thinking about, is device data. So and now device, we get absolutely. behavior, and that's another thing that can be linked into the um, mix. Absolutely, and not just you know devices as in the big medical devices. We're talking about implantable devices that's, are generating data. That's right, and even near, I'm pointing to my iPhone over there, right. but the phone is becoming clearly a, a more multifaceted uh, device for uh, capturing health data. Absolutely, So, but also on the others, I mean, so, so there's a concern with all this data coming out, increases right. privacy risks. But this is counteracted by, uh, there's a, also a rapid increase in the sophistication of the identification methods. So you, you don't have risks increasing and, and nothing happening here, it's also moving forward. Right. And there's a lot of work being done to improve the identification methods to uh, uh, c uh, deal with these risks that, that are, are cropping up. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think the, the work that's being done on the identification side is, is, is good enough to manage those risks. So um, 
and this, I mean, if you if you compare the sophistication um, from a year ago to now, there's also a leap in sophistication. So, so the identification methods are are improving quite a bit over time as well. Well, that's great. I think this is such important work to making health data precise, personal, more effective, and really. We we're at the beginning of something. Absolutely. And I think that this is all a big part of it. So we really thank you for Great. joining us today. Thank you very much, Roger. Appreciate Great it. information. Thanks. Great. Thank you.